architecture and, and biotype better. Um, but ultimately, when, once we place the implant, I think the number one factor uh, is going to be initial implant stability. You know, obviously, we're, we're placing a, a cylindrical uh, dental implant into a um, not so round uh, osteotomy in, in, in some cases. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that we have good initial stability so that we can hopefully uh place you know an immediately loaded uh, um, uh, temporary restoration especially in the aesthetic zone uh in the posterior maybe maybe a custom uh healing abutment or even a stock healing abutment uh provided that the stability allows us to do that and again you know the use of a provisional restoration or a healing abutment is really designed to maintain that soft tissue architecture so that uh uh, we have the ability to have emergence profiles and make final restorations that are indistinguishable from uh, the real tooth that might have been there. So when we talk about pathology, you know this um, uh, this is obviously a uh, slice from a cone beam CT uh, unit. Uh, this one happens to be coming from uh, uh, the Acteon uh, Prime uh, cone beam CT unit, and here you can see. Uh, there's apic, there not only is there apical pathology associated with this tooth, but we also have a uh, basically a type three socket where we're where we have a loss of both uh, hard and soft tissue, uh, no buccal plate, and in this particular case, you know, like you know, we have a lot of decisions to make on whether we would want to uh, do an immediate implant or not. For me, the first part of pathology comes from is it an active infection or you know the radiolucency at the end of this tooth is a, you know, is a, is a granuloma that comes out, you know, with the tooth. Uh, or when we go to luxate this tooth, does, uh, you know, uh, a yellow exudate come from it. Uh, in those cases, you know, it's often better to put them on antibiotic, let that clear up and come back, you know, and you got two weeks to come back within that time frame to, to evaluate it as an immediate implant as well. Do we have bone loss? Well, this particular case, you can see, we definitely have bone loss, uh, uh, both apically and buccally to this uh, tooth. And it leads us to, could we do this uh, placement with no grafting? No, I don't think that's probably uh, possible. Can we place this tooth with some supplemental grafting? This now starts to uh, starts us to look at what we call the gap or the jump distance, uh, which is that distance between the implant and the uh, the bony wall of the sockets here if we were if we were to place an implant there definitely wouldn't be any there or is this a grafting case with no implants and that's more likely the case in in this kind of a uh, uh, situation and understanding and going into the case knowing that one of these three things uh, is going to happen is the fundamentals of how you communicate with your patient through immediate implant dentistry uh, because one of these three things is going to happen. The patient needs to know that it is a, not only can we, we can somewhat predict it from the cone beam CT, but really many of these choices are made as a game time uh, decision. Here we have a, a number of slices again using the Acteon uh, uh, Prime CBCT. You can see that we have um, uh, the ability to look at an edentulous site and judge not only the bone quantity, so here you see we've got uh, almost 17 millimeters of uh, length, seven millimeters of width. Uh, however, now we can place a, a, a virtual implant into the site and see if we can maintain the biology that's needed for long-term survival of the implant. And if you, if you look at the literature, we need to maintain at least a millimeter and a half of bone all the way around the implant to be able to have a, a degree of biologic success and uh, uh, bony architecture. So here you can see we're using a BioHorizons uh, 3.5 millimeter platformed implant. The implant is in the, in the brighter yellow. There's a halo around this, which is a 1.5 millimeter halo. So when the halo of the implant can be contained within the bony walls, it's going to meet the biologic requirements for uh, the implant in this particular case. Another nice feature of this, uh, of Acteon software is the ability to create the Hansfeld units um, uh, around the implant, and as you see, you can see the density and the and uh, 
in the shading of the, the colors around the implant, it can give you also an, an average of its bone density. And from that, we can, we can get a good idea of the quality of the bone uh, because we were able to make physical measurements, but the quality, the only real assessment, there's a, there, there is some optical quality to it, but the majority of it comes from being able to diagnose uh, via the Hansfeld units. Uh, exodontia, you know, I know this is about immediate implant placement, but uh, exodontia is probably one of the best skill sets that an immediate implant surgeon can have. Because if we, we go back to that buckle plate extractor, if you, if we lose too much bone in the, in the luxation and delivery of uh, extracting teeth, then we cut down on the number of immediate implants we're going to do and turn more into grafting scenarios. Uh, I've been using, oh, for well over a year now, the uh, piezo technology. This happens to be the Acteon uh, uh, cube. And with this, it allows me to, you know, go down the, the, the PDL around the tooth to make a separation between the tooth and uh, the bone and really be able to leave the bone behind not having to use a rotary instrument to remove larger amounts of bone than we uh, than we want to. The piezo technology is uh, has been around for a while. This one just seems to have a lot more horsepower than the others, so it doesn't take uh, you know forever and a day to to get this out. And here, this gentleman has a um, a canine that we need to remove. And I'm sure most of you would be like, "All right, we got a we've got a endodontically treated." canine with a PFM over the top of it amongst some other PFM crowns. The last thing we want to do is get in there and luxate and break porcelain and, and, and break buckle plates. So the piezo technology allows us to get in there, get the tooth out. Uh, you can see by maintaining all the bone 360 degrees around, you know, getting the tooth out um, uh, in, in one piece, the bone uh, stuck to it is uh, really a, um, uh, the, the goal of ours. So when we talk about, you know, uh, choosing an implant and implant design, you know, the, there's a lot of implants that work out there. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, uh, the implants that I use uh, and, and some of the reasons why I use them. We need an implant that's designed for initial stability with an aggressive thread pattern. If we, if we have a shallow V-shaped thread, we're going to have far less initial stability and we'll be able to place far fewer um, uh, temporary restorations on there. You know, you also need to have a system that has a full line of these uh, uh, implants because as you can see, the, the, width and, the width of ridges and the depth of the bone is different in every particular site. So whether we are using, um, you know, a smaller diameter uh, two-piece implant in the, in the aesthetic zone and in the lateral positions to immediate molars, uh, you know, to replace a molar. We need to have that whole line. Uh, we need to have it designed so it allow for both crestal and subcrestal placements. So depending upon the situation versus, you know, the crown to implant height, soft tissue, uh, biotype, all these things make a difference in where the platform of the implant ends up. We want to have an immediate molar option. Uh, one of the hardest areas to uh, ridge preservate uh, with grafting is the molars because it's so difficult to get primary closure. Immediate molars can, can bridge that gap uh, for sure. And what we see here, uh, and I use, is the BioRisons Tapered Pro. Uh, it's, it's got a platform shifted collar so that we can uh, preserve the vital crustal bone and, and, and also preserve and uh, uh, maybe even exemplify the, the, the soft tissue um, uh, profile around it. The Taper Pro also exhibits or also has laser lock technology um, on the collar. And if you're not familiar with laser lock, it's a micro channel um, that creates a physical connective tissue attachment as well as a bony attachment. So it's a dual, it has a dual affinity uh, for both bone and soft tissue. It's the only surface treatment in the U.S. that uh, allows uh, the FDA to tell uh, someone that you can talk about bo having both hard and soft tissue attachments uh, uh, to it. And this is important because 
if the implant is on an uneven ridge and you can't or you don't want to get this as the entire implant crestal or subcrestal, the ability for soft tissue to adhere to the collar is going to create a biologic seal between the implant, the bone, and the, and the, and the soft tissue, making it a um, uh, making it a technology for me and an immediate implants that is uh, 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 highly important. Yeah, it's got uh, helical cutting flutes at the end so that we can uh, have good initial stability. One of the keys to immediate implants is to get beyond the apex of the extraction site and, and engage host bone. And it's also got a, um, uh, a more aggressive, deeper thread pattern for better initial stability. Also comes in a, um, uh, a wide-bodied immediate implant molar. This is fairly new to the BioRizon system. And uh, uh, one of my favorite implants uh, uh, to place comes in seven and eight millimeter diameters, short as seven five, as tall as 10 and a half, got the same threads, uh, uh, laser locked and so forth. So when we're talking about stability, you know, how do we know what, uh, what stable is? Well, for the longest time, all we've had is the torque value at the time of placement. Uh, measured in Newton centimeters, there's an initial torque value that we can use both hand torque or, as you'll see, there are implant motors that uh, will uh, give you that readout uh, once the implant has been placed. And then we can always try a reverse torque test on them, uh, both at the time of placement and uh, at the time of restoration. I'm not a huge fan of reverse torque testing uh, at, at, at four months, but it uh, used to be all we had. Many people still use percussion on the, on the implant, you know, uh, such as the back, uh, the, the, the blunt end of a mirror handle. Um, those with a lot of experience, uh, you know, this is still a pretty uh, reliable technique, but again, it comes from uh, repetition and experience. Today, uh, every implant that we, we place at the clinic, uh, we use uh, resonance frequency analysis or the ISQ, uh, stands for Implant Stability Quotient. It's the only test that we can perform at both the time of placement and the time of restoration so that uh, uh, we know um, uh, uh, we have a likelihood of osteointegration happening. So here's the ISQ scale, it, it, it gives you a number from you know less than 60 to greater than 70, and within that uh, within that range, it can say you know 60 to 65. You may want to do a traditional two-stage approach, and then when you get over 70, one stage with immediately load immediately loading uh, characteristics is uh, 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 more predominant, and you know the the. Uh, the research is very clear on this. There's hundreds of papers out there uh, uh, on ISQ, and uh, today we've actually been able to find technologies that uh, um, are affordable for you know every patient. Here's an immediate number nine uh, that we did uh, extraction number nine and uh, freehand placement initial torque value of uh, uh, 40 newtons. Here you'll see the WNH motor was set uh, to a max of 40. Um, I'm sure the torque value could have gone higher than that, um, but that's where we set it, uh, set it at. We used a, an Austel Smart Peg and uh, the WNH motor that actually has the uh, ISQ built in. And here we found we had a 60, uh, we had a, six, a 72 reading for the ISQ and a green bar. Basically, you got the green light to either place a healing abutment or a uh, temporary restoration on there if you so choose. And again, that's exactly what we did. We fabricated an immediately loaded temporary crown uh, that was screw retained, uh, screwed, uh, screwed it into place, Teflon over the hex, covered it up with uh, composite, and again. This was day of surgery, minimizes the bleeding, maximizes soft tissue uh, healing, and it provides us with the best opportunity to create a um, uh, soft tissue architecture that uh, uh, will be like the natural tooth. Another case of freehand dentistry failing number seven, uh, patient had uh, returned to their general dentist multiple times uh, after having these crowns and endo done. Uh, tooth number seven continued to be painful uh, upon probing uh, we found a deep mesial probing 
and uh, in my experience and the lack of, uh, uh, you know, in, in the, in the site of good endo, we, we developed a diagnosis of a fractured tooth with the aid of the, uh, the cube, uh, piezo technology, remove the tooth, uh, keeping the buccal plate and the papilla preserved. If we can avoid, if we can avoid tearing the papillas apart and, and reflecting them, uh, that architecture of those can, preser can be preserved uh, better. Freehand placement, you can see where the, the initial pilot drill is angled to the pallets and beyond the apex for uh, uh, initial stability. Here's the, uh, here's the final osteotomy. And then um, uh, here you see we're using a perio probe to determine where we would like the platform to be. Many of the, the, the criteria we're looking for for the final uh, platform placement, two to three millimeters below the adjacent CEJs, one to two millimeters subcrestal to the buccal plate. All these, you know, all these uh, uh, numbers are important in getting the platform in the correct position to provide for, again, an emergence profile that looks like uh, a real tooth. Here, uh, once the implant was placed, this is a four point, uh, this is a 4.2 by 12 millimeter, or four, I think it's a four, actually a 4.6 by uh, uh, 15 millimeter BioRisons tapered plus. Uh, the gap distance was less than two millimeters, so we elected to uh, not graph this area. The literature is pretty specific on two millimeters. Anything less than two millimeters shows that 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 gap or that jump distance is filled in with blood on its own. Plus it's very difficult to graft that narrow of a um, uh, deal. Over two millimeters, they suggest you graft, uh, whether it's with collagen or uh, some kind of uh, particulate, where, whether it's xeno or aloe or whatever. Uh, here's our immediate temporary crown. You can see the, the, the implant. It's got a, a temporary on a peak plastic abutment. Uh, so that's why there's no radiolucency to that uh, uh, temporary. Here's what it, here's what it looks like four months postoperatively, and what we're looking for is the papilla maintenance, the the brilliant pink of the soft tissue, minimal uh, minimal bleeding, and that um, that emergence of uh, the crown as if it was a uh, real tooth. The final prosthetic uh, pictured here is a final zirconia core with layered GC initial line porcelain. Uh, it was cemented onto a hybrid uh, a titanium abutment with laser lock. So that same technology that uh, is available on the implant uh, collar is also available on the underside of a uh, abutment. And that allows, again, for a soft tissue adherence to the underside of the abutment and creating that biologic uh, seal to the, even in this case, even to the micro gap. Uh, so the final restoration was done by Pro Smiles Dental Studios. And here we see a four month progression of the case from uh, preoperatively to postoperatively to post prosthetic. Uh, so we're just checking. You can see from um, postoperatively to post prosthetic, you can see that the bone has consolidated in and around the threads of this uh, uh, implant. The bone has been maintained uh, at the the crestal bone has been maintained, and the abutment and all the pieces are uh, fully seated. Any test of an implant and your plan is how it looks in the, um, you know, it looks in the future. Here we have a two-year follow-up uh, on tooth number seven. And from a distance, this looks like a great case. You can see that the, the papilla between seven and eight is, is slightly blunted. Um, it's not as a, a knife edge as it is between eight and nine. This could be most likely the tooth is slightly over contoured in that area should probably be um, could not probably it could be removed and shaved down you know to uh, to a little bit more however the patient loves this outcome and John Coyce taught me uh, uh, years ago that not to bring to the patient the patient's attention a problem that they don't know exists and for us, that uh, um, it 
it looks like more of a problem blown up on our screen. But in a patient's mouth from six feet away today during social distancing, um, there is no, you know, trust me, there's no cosmetic problem in this and there's no reason to bring this to the attention of the patient. Uh, also the true test of an implant. Here we have a two year follow up on the far right. Uh, maybe even some bone growth in some areas. So we still have, you know, solid white crustal bone, no bone loss. Uh, components are all together like there's a, um, uh, uh, this is what you'd like to see. Also, it gives you a good uh, indicator that this, this implant crown is probably going to survive the test of time here. So what happens if, you wanna, if you're into guided surgery, if you want to do these cases guided? Well, there's no issue here. You know, in this particular case, uh, it was done in our clinic not too long ago uh, by our uh, uh, team dentists, um, Dr. Steve Vorholt and uh, Dr. Christine Kieber. Uh, they did this case in conjunction with each other. Um, Dr. Bohrholt is one of the mentors at uh, Implant Pathway, and uh, Dr. Kieber is the, uh, the chief clinical dentist at uh, New Horizons Dental Institute. So this is their case. Implant uh, bridge uh, 9 through 11, uh, single implant crown number 12. Uh, they planned uh, 4.2 and 4.6 tapered pros in the BioRizon um, uh, arsenal. It's going to be a fully guided using BioRizon's uh, 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 guided surgery kit. And uh, before I go, the 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 guide was printed on a Sprint Row uh, uh, Sprint Ray uh, printer. So here was their uh, pre-surgical plan. Uh, you can see there's going to be teeth coming out. Patient is uh, not uh, not unfamiliar with implant dentistry, so understands uh, what the uh, what the procedure is and the risks that are going on. Using Acteon's AIS uh, software, we can actually uh, trim a plan and fabricate the surgical guide plan all within the same software. Uh, so here you'll find um, the plan, uh, reflection of the soft tissue to reveal the non-restorable teeth that uh, uh, lie beneath it, uh, the use of piezo technology and removing these teeth so that we have no buckle plate uh, uh, removal. So we have good bone um, uh, that's left over for us uh, uh, to utilize. The plan uh, placed uh, three implants into this uh, into this site. These are, um, again, this is a fully guided system, which means the implants are going to go in through the guide itself. And the use of authentic, uh, the use of authentic BioHorizon uh, uh, sleeves through this guided surgery uh, uh, phase. Once the initial osteotomies were placed, we double checked uh, the uh, the case by removing the um, removing the surgical guide, placing the parallel pins to see exactly where we want to go. Not that we don't believe the surgical guide, but this gives us an opportunity to have the patient bite down and physically see where uh, these are. Or you know, we're, we'd like to have a screw retain uh, um, uh, screw retain restoration. This uh, uh, the scenario is going to be a three unit screw retain bridge and then a single uh, number twelve unit on the one side. Uh, few images of the uh, guided drilling technique and the protocol. Again, during guided surgery, it's of the utmost importance to uh, go in and out multiple times, allowing the, the saline to uh, uh, cool the drill and also to get down into the drilling channel. Uh, we often use uh, additional uh, we often use uh, additional uh, sources of irrigation to allow for uh, 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 cooling of the bone. Most, most necrosis uh, from the crustal bone through guided surgeries comes from the generation of heat uh, with the limited ability for the irrigant to go down. So we do these uh, steps to ensure that. Here you'll see the, the, the implants going in through the fully guided uh, kit. Uh, the vertical stop is uh, uh, maintained through the fork and uh, the, seating, uh, the seating grooves within the uh, delivery system of it. 
Here you'll see all three implants uh, were delivered to the specified uh, depth. Money shot looking down through the um, through the surgical guide and seeing the platforms uh, uh, right exactly where we want them to be. ISQs again uh, as we talk about that uh, uh, that scale. Uh, we uh, ISQs going from number eight to number twelve, eighty six, eighty two, and uh, uh, ninety three. I think that's safe to say this could be immediately loaded uh, with those ISQ um, uh, rankings. Postoperatively, here we see uh, the implants obviously placed in a good prosthetic position. Uh, the more implants that you get placed in there, the tougher the cone beam uh, images can be. As you can see, the, the, the scatter radiation and the blowout from all the uh, uh, titanium, but implants maintaining a good millimeter and a half to two millimeters of bone all the way, uh, all the way around. So one of the best immediate uh, sites, in my opinion, is the, the, the premolar or the, the bicuspid. And I think it's probably some of the most technically easy sites is the majority of them are single rooted. And if we uh, keep our drills very vertical and pushed against either the palate or the lingual plate. Uh, we're going to uh, we're going to find that freehanding these implants are going to be um, something you can add to the toolbox of your um, procedures very easily. Uh, gap distance two or more. We're going to fill that space with graft material. Good results have been being obtained by filling these gap distances with just uh, uh, collagen, such as a, a, a bio plug. And the use of wide helium abutments uh, can also socket seal these areas. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's a pair of immediate uh, bicuspids we did not too long ago. Um, the key also is maintaining that the distance not only from the adjacent teeth, but from the, the implants them, themselves. And we'd like to have three millimeters of width between the implants. This particular uh, case is probably a little less than three millimeters, but we have good, um, good, we have good inner implant bone, and uh, the likelihood of uh, maintaining that bone should be fairly high in this instance. So here's the implants in their final resting positions. Here we used a bio plug, cut it in half, and we're going to fill that gap, uh, uh, that gap distance with uh, the the collagen place a couple stock healing abutments in this site. The patient elected not to have um, uh, screw retained temporaries at this, uh, at this time. So this is, uh, this is what we used. And post-op cone beam CT shows the vertical nature of uh, 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 the implant being placed. Good distance between the buckle plates uh, and, the, and the implant staying uh, to the lingual. And lower molars. Lower molars, uh, divergent roots can make the best immediate implant placement, uh, especially if we can go in between uh, the, the root sites. Oftentimes we're forced to pick one of the socket sites. I use a Lindemann uh, side cutting burr to cut towards the center without going through it to encroach into that ideal implant position. Remember, if we can't put the implant in the ideal position with an immediate, then we need to think that maybe this is a case where we need to graft the entire site and come back and place the implant in an ideal position. Because the last thing we want to do is get an off-angled implant causing us to have cantilevers in any one direction, uh, which puts us at uh, higher risk for crustal bone loss, food impaction, and screw loosening. Uh, sometimes. Uh, I kind of envision the crown being there and I, uh, and I envision the position of the final screw placement coming out the, the center of that tooth in the center fossa. And if there's enough bone to go in between the roots, we'd want to use it that way and put the implant in the exact ideal position. As with any kind of a molar immediate uh, placement, you need to have wider implants as a backup uh, to be able to um, um, uh, ensure that the ability to place an immediate is there. Again, however, if you start to if you start to stray from ideal, the best thing to do is just graft it and come back another time. As much as I love immediate implant placement, uh, really the the best thing you can do is come back at an at a later date. Um, 
I don't like to leave any kind of immediates in a spinning situation. I always hope to get to 30 to 40 Newtons of initial stability so that we can place uh, the healing abutment on the implant, either graft uh, the, the gap distance with allograft or a, a bio plug, use a chromic or PGA sutures uh, uh, to hold the tissue and the bio plugs in place. Um, healing abutments as well, especially wide ones to start. Uh, we want to try to socket seal and create a uh, a smaller gap distance for the soft tissue as well. And remember, we I spoke about it earlier. You know, you got to remain. You got to make sure that you tell the patients um, uh, that things may not always go as planned, and that they may leave with just a graft and no implant. What I do tell my patients is that you're always going to get my best, and I'm always going to do what's right for you. So. If this scenario was in my own mouth, knowing what I know, if I would if I would want to have it grafted for myself, that's exactly what I'm going to do for my uh, patient as well. Here's kind of an example of the two different styles. Uh, the image on the left was a was an osteotomy that we uh, drug to the uh, drug to the center line with a Lindemann and then created the osteotomy. And then on the right, obviously, the roots were very divergent and we were able to use available bone that was in between the roots, basically not um, uh, having a lot of exposed uh, uh, threads. Now, upper immediate molar placement, uh, they, sometimes it can be more difficult uh, as the roots tend to be conical, especially if you're doing second molar uh, immediate placements. The quality of the bone is often softer in the maxilla as well. So our, our quest for initial stability may be uh, at a disadvantage on the, um, uh, on, on the maxilla. With the three-rooted design of the maxillary molars, it sometimes is easier to get to the center line uh, where the roots are more divergent. And also be aware of the sinus floor. It's easy to drill into the sinus floor while preparing the osteotomy. And even if this happens, uh, there is no real negative outcome from this other than maybe a cross-sectional CT that would raise some eyebrows. Uh, the literature is pretty clear that if the implant uh, ends up slightly into the sinus, there's no uh, additional risk for uh, uh, implant failure. I like to fill these root sites, especially uh, the maxillary molars with bio plugs. Uh, you can use regular grafting material if you'd like. So to try to avoid uh, placement into the palatal root, uh, uh, we want to make sure um, we want to use screw retained restorations. Uh, if you find yourself placing your immediates into the palatal root because it exists and it's there, you're going to end up with cantilevered restorations to the buckle that will cause uh, that will lead to additional buckle bone loss, which will then translate to soft tissue recession, and you'll have food impaction under these. So we want to get our key position is to be um, in the center of the tooth, you know, in line with the center fossas and centered mesial distally and buccal lingually within the uh, socket itself. So as with any immediate molar, the key to immediate molars is getting the root, uh, the, getting the root of the tooth out, roots of the tooth out without uh, uh, removing any of the bone. All of my molar, um, Extraction start by sectioning the clinical crown off to level with the soft tissue. If they've had pre-implant treatment, aka uh, endodontic treatment, it gives me a roadmap for sectioning uh, the roots between these teeth apart so that I can, uh, uh, I can then basically treat this molar as three single rooted teeth instead of one three rooted tooth if that makes sense to you, because removing single rooted teeth is much easier using the technology that we just uh, uh, talked about and for preserving uh, bone. So it kind of looks like an up, uh, upside down Y or a P symbol. We're gonna get the tooth out of there. Uh, here's our initial osteotomy. You can see uh, it's centered mesial distally, buccal lingually down the center fossas. Here's our parallel pin showing the position itself. And then the final osteotomy, um, is uh, is right there. Implant placement. This is a uh, 5.8 by 10 and a half BioHorizons tapered plus. Hit the 40 newtons of initial uh, stability. So uh, the placement of a healing abutment and grafting those areas is going to be the ideal treatment for this site. Uh, 
unless the patient specifically wants to have a screw retained restoration, I'll either use a custom healing abutment or a stock healing abutment in my uh, in the molars. With these molars, it's also um, it's also easy to harvest some drill chips. Autogenous a, a, a uh, bone graft is always going to be the best bone graft you can use. So you can place this in the um, in the root sites and then a collar plug over the top to uh, um, uh, hold that graft material in place. Here you see we weren't we didn't disturb the papillas as much, so we placed the graft material. We put the bio plugs in the healing abutments and uh, sent the patient on their merry way. Here's another case where we have a, uh, a failing, um, uh, failing upper left uh, first molar from uh, endo. Here is our treatment plan for an implant. Again, uh, abundant bone beyond the apices of this tooth, so the ability to get a uh, initial stability should be high from the treatment planning phase. And if you look at that size of bone, uh, rarely do I get this, but uh, makes for good pictures here. Uh, extraction without loss of bone. Here is our osteotomy parallel pin showing it both uh, in line in all directions. Here is uh, the uh, the 5.8 um, uh, by 10 and a half tapered plus uh, biorizin implant. Uh, initial uh, torque stability. Bio plugs into the extraction sites. Chromic um, Chromic suit, four O chromic sutures over the top to hold the place, and as you can see, that that wide healing abutment is going to allow for a much smaller soft tissue gap around there and a much better emergence profile and, and thicker keratinized tissue from this from this technique. Here's our final PA showing the implant in its position, and finally, uh, immediate implants uh, with wide-bodied implants. Um, they can be your go-to for immediate molars if that's uh, if, if that's your uh, choosing. They can also be your rescue implant for like the last two cases I've seen where the 5.8 uh, is just uh, doesn't have enough stability or the the osteotomy had uh, the the teeth the roots were more conical and there was less bone in the in the middle. The keys to success for any wide-bodied implant is getting the implant subcrestal. You can't recover implant dentistry. You can't recover from the implant being too far buccal and too far supercrestal. So, uh, keeping these wide-bodied implants subcrestal is going to be the key. You almost always have good stability with these wide-bodied. I've, I've rarely not had the stability I'm looking for in the, on this implant size, and they're very tough to cover up and also to uncover. So, I recommend you put a healing abutment on these every time, uh, because again. It, it cuts down on the amount of soft tissue that needs to uh, uh, creep across the, 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 the surgical site. And all the restorations, in my opinion, should be screw retained if at all possible. Uh, make sure your lab knows how to restore such cases. In the BioRizon's immediate molar system, uh, not only do we use the, uh, the regular surgical tapered internal kit from that's behind that, uh, but we also have a row of uh, uh, drills that correspond to the final implant uh, size. Again, there's six sizes of the of the molar. The depth, the the drills are actually depth specific. So the top of the drill is the the top of the implant. So on the left, you can see we're getting into that a molar extraction site. On the right, you can see the drill is slightly subcrestal, uh, copious amounts of irrigation. Uh, going in and coming back out uh, uh, at a at a high rate of frequency. Implants going in no more than 50 RPMs. Um, I deliver them with the handpiece, and then if they torque out, uh, I put them I put them in their final position with a, a, a ratchet. So there's our immediate molar. Uh, these systems have a 5.8 millimeter platform with a seven and eight millimeter wide uh, implant. The criteria for immediate molars is really no different than any other uh, uh, implant. We still need to maintain bone all circumferentially around the implant of millimeter and a half to two. That's the biology of immediate implants is uh, having enough bone. We know if we thin the buccal plate or any of the bone too much, over time the bone will recede. We know if bone recedes, soft tissue follows, and then we can have uh, uh, issues with it. 
uh, understand the depth to vital structures such as nerves and sinuses, and again, the quality of the bone, uh, the undersizing of these osteotomies is sometimes important in the maxilla when using these immediate molars. And the torque's always going to be high, you know, they, uh, 20 plus newtons to put the, the healing abutment on. I tell you, I don't think I've ever placed one under probably 35 or 40 um, as well. And then they almost always give you a high ISQ. We'd like to have a 65 or higher to be able to place that healing abutment on top. Again, just a cover screw in these cases is very difficult to get it to uh, um, heal over the top is that eight millimeter wide is a lot of soft tissue to grow over the top. And the tissue is going to be of a thin biotype because there's no blood supply coming from the top of, a, uh, of an implant, as you can imagine. And if we want to immediately load these things, again, we want to hit 40 and then 70 on the ISQ uh, uh, scale. So ideally, we want to be slightly subcrestal. Here we have a maxillary uh, immediate molar on the left side being, uh, you know, probably a millimeter subcrestal and then a, another immediate molar on the right side here, replacing a second molar. Not my favorite place to do. Um, uh, I'm not a big fan of second molar uh, implant dentistry, but uh, some of our patients uh, want their second molars back, especially if they have one on the maxilla. And if the patient is given, uh, if, if the patient is given uh, uh, the risk associated with second molar implants and they so choose to go forward with it and they meet the criteria for bone quality, bone uh, quantity, and all those things that we talked about over the last hour, then, um, then I will do a second molar uh, uh, immediate. That is, uh, that is what I have for you. I took almost an hour of your, uh, uh, of your time. Uh, let's see if we have, um, uh, do we have some questions? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Justin, for the very informative and very excellent, actually, presentation, touching on all the immediate loading, immediate placements. I've got a couple of questions actually coming from the audience. The first question coming um, uh, from, uh, I think, uh, Daniel saying, uh, if you can shed some light on the relationship between Hounsfield and bone density or bone quality. Um, do you rely on Hounsfield's units, especially with different machines, give you different measures, different uh, readings? Uh, I don't, sorry. sorry, go ahead. I don't put a lot of stock in the Hounsfield units. Uh, you know, the truth of the matter is, I think I've seen enough CTs over the time to be able to see, you know, I can, I can kind of judge the, the density of the bone uh, just from the slice itself and the trabecular pattern within the, uh, within the bone. Yeah, you know, the the Hansfeld units. Uh, you know, I found you know nine hundred or higher. You know, generally gives us a good stability. But I've found I've had cases where uh, the the software said we had high Hansfeld units and the bone was a lot mushier than I thought it was going to be. So uh, I kind of agree. Like I'm, and it does vary from machine to machine. Like yeah, you know, every, every every machine is different for sure. So it's more subjective decision, I would say, by looking at the bone and. Uh feeling the bone when you do the osteotomy rather than having the figures in mind and you go for one. I, think there's, I, I just don't think there's, there's no substitution for that tactile sense of, right. of, of, of the bone. And that's, that's one of the disadvantages to guided surgery is that you, yeah. you lose that tactile sense of what that bone quality is like. Yeah. Um, Justin, there's a question coming from uh, one of our audience asking about the justification or rationale of having three implants in a patient who have already got four implants, uh, replacing, I think, four units uh, by the um, uh, Dr. Vorholt and Kieber, uh, replacing, I think, upper left central lateral canine and first premolar, the number 9, 10, 11, 12, I think. Yeah, so the the... The patient had had previous implant treatment, uh, had already multiple implants in place, and did not desire to have, you know, any of those removed and uh, associated it with, uh, you know, maybe a full arch prosthesis or a segmented prosthesis. So uh, uh, with the available bone and the implants that were, um, the available bone and the, and, the, and the socket sites that were uh, left over, uh, they made the decision to create a three-unit bridge from uh, nine to 11 and then uh, a single unit uh, uh, 
on 12. And basically it came down to, because uh, I had the same you know conversations with them uh, as we were going over this case as well. And one of them, uh, one of those was the fact that, uh, uh, that the bone in that middle section just wasn't of the, of the <coughs> Um, so in that, in that lateral site, uh, if they were to have put four implants in with all single units, the, the distances between the implants, uh, would have been compromised by the, the, the titanium that was in there. So that's what they came up with. Yeah. And how about the clinking all implants, uh, given the fact you have got only two natural left, uh, two teeth left in the upper arch after placing three implants, you ended up with seven implants in the maxilla with only two retained teeth on the upper right quadrant. Well, you know, some people like to just hold on to their damn teeth. Uh, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, you know, unfortunately, uh, un un unfortunately uh, you know, patients have a say in this and uh, we can only do the best we can to guide them into a, yeah. you know, what we, what we consider to be a, you know, a better long-term, you know, um, uh, prognosis, but, uh, uh, as you can see from from this from that case, uh, the patient has has been what we call maybe a patchwork patient. You know, like break a tooth, fix a tooth with an implant. Totally you know, agree, like, especially like, patients coming from different practices, different hospitals. Different oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Like we're the last it's better to keep things as they are rather than get in trouble. A hundred percent. You know. Um, Justin, another question coming from James McKenna asking about the saying, thank you very much for the awesome presentation. And do you prefer to immediately temporize anterior implants with sufficient initial stability, or do you prefer an alternative approach like healing abutments or Essex retainer? Uh, if, if I've got adequate, uh, if I've got adequate um, uh, stability, both in Newton's and in ISQ, uh, especially in the aesthetic zone, I, I just, um, I want to I want to put a restoration in there, a screw retained restoration in there almost every time. Uh, you also have to consider, you know, what kind of um, uh, occlusal scheme that we're going into as well. You know, if the patient, you know, if the patient has a uh, is a known parafunctional habit or has uh, an an undesirable occlusal scheme, then it may be something that I would go to a custom healing abutment and then maybe an Essex during that uh, uh, deal. So that's where every immediate doesn't fall into a cookie cutter. You know, right. even though, we, you know, even though sometimes we have the stabilities and say, Oh, hell, we should do a, a temporary on here. You know, there's, there, there's certain other extenuating circumstances that be like, you know what, it's still going to be better if we get this osseo integration done without any kind of load, because we know most people are going to go. Definitely. Definitely. Most people can go back to chewing on it, whether we tell them to or not. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to be safe rather than sorry. I agree with you. Some, it's case specific as well. Um, J Justin, you know, you get the patients, if they go back to normal to, to work and to some sensitive type of work, they, they need some, some teeth there and some immediate replacement. But people going probably staying at home for a couple of days or probably a partial danger, air sex retainer or, or shit might do the job for them. Yeah. Um, another question saying, what is your um, occlusion management for the immediately loaded implant? And would you take it out of guidance? And what's your opinion on splinting neighboring implants? Yeah, so um, in, the, in the temporary phase, um, I like to have them out of function, out of occlusion. So if it's in the aesthetic zone, you know, taking them uh, fully into excursions without it, without any touching uh, of it, um, and in and obviously in maximum cuspation. But we know that uh, you know even though if they're out of function, out of occlusion, without a bolus of food in there, at the minute the patient uh, you know begins to eat and use those areas, we're going to load that. Uh, as far as having multiple implants uh, uh, next to each uh, next to each other. Um, uh, in the temporary phase, I would definitely, even if I'm planning single unit final restorations, uh, I would still splint them in the, uh, in, in, the, in the healing phase. Right. Okay. Good, Justin. Thank you very much. I've got a question from my side, actually. Is, um, you tend to have wider platform for molar teeth replacements. Um, how do you feel about having a wider platform, especially when you've got some a restricted, um, I would say, measures or bone height, especially in the infra maxillary sinus region or the uh, 
ID canal region. And so if you put a wider implant at superficial position with the uh, fixture head is very close to the crystal bone or probably could be supracrystal. And how would that relate to the bone maintenance and the uh, shape of the crown, which will be coming on the top of it? Do you think it's going to be a good idea or is better to have a narrower implant going a little bit subcrystal and getting better uh, emergence profile? Well, that's always the, the, the million dollar question, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it does come down to available bone okay, and, the, let's go, and, let's the, go. and the ability to be able to um, get that platform subcrestal because the, in the molar set, the yeah. most, the most important part is going to be. Can you still? Can you wash? My eye mask. There we go. Um, so for me, uh, I still like a wide-bodied implant with a wide platform uh, for the emergence of uh, molars, so that we don't have food impaction on the mesial and distal. Uh, 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 contacts. However, it has to be uh, subcrestal. The the implant has to get down there deep enough so that you can have that emergence. So, uh, you know, uh, the the shorter the shorter implants. You know, BioRizon makes a six millimeter tall implant that comes in the four six and the five eight diameter. I will um, I will back down to those in those shallower areas so that I can get a better a better emergence. Hopefully, that answered that question. Hello. Justin. Yep. Um, you not you won't necessarily end up with a mushroom type crown shape on the top of your fixture, especially if you have got very limited bone height in the posterior region. Uh, my concern is the bone loss around that area and also the maintenance along with the soft tissue. Uh, basically, if you don't give enough soft tissue uh, travel distance, you might end up with early bone loss. You know, that's a, you know, there's, that's a direct correlation between, you know, having a good soft tissue profile and maintaining that crustal bone. And, uh, you know, my, uh, I, I do use a lot of uh, immediate molars. You know, part of it is the way, the way that I practice and the amount of uh, distance that a lot of my patients travel to come see me. Um, yeah. But my, my go-to is not those immediate molars. That's, uh, uh, my go-to is the 5.8. Which is a platform shifted okay. down to a is down is platform shifted to a four point five millimeter platform. That is my that's my ideal uh, molar, and that's the majority of those that I showed with that five eight five eight diameter with a four five platform. Uh, yeah, you know only only as a bailout or only into those scenarios uh, with ample bone do I do I end up into that immediate molar site. I agree with you. I mean, 5.8 platform switch to 4.5 would be great for a molar tooth. Seven and eight millimeters, I've just got a feeling that it's going to be too wide for an implant crown, especially when you have got like a smaller size tooth, uh, basically. Uh, so I think 5.8 to 4.2 platform switch, I think would make a big difference and uh, make sense, to be honest with you. Yeah, that's, that's my go-to. Yeah, I agree with you. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Justin, for the uh, great presentation. Uh, actually, we enjoyed it thoroughly, all of us. And uh, thanks for the time to put these uh, cases together. And I very much hope that you will be able to join us sometime as well soon after the lockdown period, hopefully in the summertime, uh, with more full art cases, uh, Justin. I mean, this was about single unit and immediate placement, um, immediate loading, but hopefully we can come back again with some more um, ideas and thoughts and sharing our case and experiences about full arch, immediate placements and loading. I'd, uh, uh, I'd be honored to be asked back. Thank you very much, uh, Justin. Thanks very much everybody for joining us tonight. It's a bit late now and hopefully we'll see you sometime soon with more webinars. And uh, we have got a webinar coming on Friday on bone manipulation by one of our prominent speakers in London. So hopefully you can join us. It's gonna be 8.30. UK time and uh, all the best for all of us. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you indeed.